Good day and hello from Medicis Edutech. The UG Dentistry Portfolio. We are here to provide online and blended delivery of undergraduate and continuing education for the health sector. We are providing digital teaching and learning aids to comprehensively support outcome based healthcare education. We have designed both the learning management system and the study material. We have prepared material for the disciplines of medicine, dentistry, homeopathy and nursing according to their respective curricula. Other streams like physiotherapy, pharmacy etc. are in progress. Our product design and features. Our product is a set of digital books so named as each of them has a page turn format. The entire digital page is divided into a left two-thirds of the screen which shows the subject content and the right one-third of the screen which shows the related and relevant exhibits. We have the readable text in bullet points and short paragraphs, easy to understand and to remember by the students. This digibook is embedded with exhibits on every page in the form of rich illustrations, video clips, animations, on the right side column of the page. The image or video can be enlarged by clicking on it and thus can be utilized for a more detailed understanding. Video clips and animations also have an audio or voiceover explaining them. Erupts into the oral cavity at the age of 7 to 8 years. The crown length of the tooth is about 10.5 mm. The root length is 13 mm. The mesiodistal diameter of the crown is 8.5 mm. We also have provision for incorporating specific learning objectives which open on clicking the buttons on the bottom bar here. Once the objectives are made clear, we can get into the book format itself. Every topic or digital book is also embedded with audiovisual lectures which are richly animated and delivered with detailed audio descriptions alongside the text. The central inserts, they are notated or only teeth which are in contact mesially. The little difference between the ridge and an edge we will discuss later in the topic. These can be used for self-study by the students. The faculty can also utilize them to explain a particular topic especially using the animations. We have a large compilation of questions for objective evaluation. They are linked to the digital books and appear in the same bar at the bottom of the page so that they can be utilized then and there for self-assessment to brush up learning and to assess the class or group's understanding. That is, these can be used for both self-directed learning and for classroom evaluation. The very interesting and valuable feature of our compendium we have detailed, high-quality, live dissection modules with explanations and embedded text wherever required. It is equivalent to a student learning real dissection in a laboratory with our high-definition video quality and the expert audio description by the subject specialist. Thyroid gland is a butterfly-shaped endocrine gland situated in the anterior midline of the neck opposite to 5th, 6th, 7th and 8th cervical vertebra and 1st thoracic vertebra. It is a highly vascular endocrine gland situated in front of the neck. The thyroid gland is covered by two capsules. Let's learn about the capsules. Thyroid gland has an outer covering called as outer false capsule and an inner covering called as inner true capsule. The outer false capsule is derived by splitting of the pretracheal fascia whereas the inner true capsule is formed by the condensation of fibrous connective tissue stroma of the thyroid gland. Attachments of the false capsule. Above it is attached to the hyoid bone in the midline and oblique line of the thyroid cartilage laterally. Below the false capsule 
blends with the fibrous pericardium. From the medial surface of the lateral lobe, this false capsule is thickened to form ligament of Berry, which connects the medial surface of the thyroid gland to the cricoid cartilage. This ligament of Berry is responsible for movement of the thyroid gland up and down during deglutition. The applied importance of the false capsule. Now, in the thyroid gland, between the false capsule and the true capsule, the space contains parathyroid glands and trunks of the blood vessels of the thyroid. The venous plexus of the thyroid gland is situated deep to the true capsule and hence during surgical removal of the thyroid, the gland is removed along with its true capsule. Now this is different from the prostate removal where the venous plexus is situated between the true capsule and the false capsule. Hence, during surgical removal of the prostate, the true capsule is left behind, whereas in thyroid gland removal, the thyroid gland is removed along with the true capsule. Parts of the thyroid gland. Thyroid gland consists of two lateral lobes. Let's begin with reflection of the skin. Separate the superficial fascia from the skin without damaging the subcutaneous nerves, vessels and fibers of platysma which lie immediately deep to the skin. Roof of the posterior triangle. Roof of the posterior triangle is formed by skin, superficial fascia and platysma. After reflecting the skin, we can see the superficial fascia, we can see the fasciculi of platysma. This is the lower part of platysma which is seen forming the roof of posterior triangle. Upper part forms roof of the anterior triangle. Once we remove the superficial fascia, we can clearly define the extent of platysma. Let's reflect roof of the posterior triangle formed by platysma to expose the boundaries and contents of posterior triangle. Boundaries of posterior triangle. Posterior triangle is bounded anteriorly by the posterior border of sternocleidomastite, posteriorly by the anterior border of trapezius. This is the anterior border of trapezius. And base of the triangle is formed by middle third of clavicle. These are the boundaries of the posterior triangle. Subdivisions. The posterior triangle is subdivided by the inferior belly of homohyoid into a lower subclavian or supraclavicular triangle. Practical procedures. Please cover the laboratory sessions in the pre- and paraclinical dental subjects and also the examinations of procedures in the clinical subjects. These are also video-based modules combined with appropriate text, including a detailed audio description of the indications, the steps of the procedure, best practices, etc. for each particular topic. Keep all apparatus clean and dry. Take adequate RBC fluid in a watch glass. Prick the finger under aseptic conditions. Coming to the precautions. Puncture should be deep enough to allow spontaneous flow of blood. Do not squeeze the finger as squeezing expresses tissue fluid. Wipe off fast drop of blood as it is mixed with tissue fluid. While sucking the blood, the blood column should not be fragmented nor should it contain air bubble. Coming to the procedure. Suck the blood up to 0.5 mark of the RBC pipette. Then immediately suck the diluting fluid up to 1 at 1 mark. Blood in the pipette should be diluted quickly otherwise blood clots in the pipette. Hold the pipette horizontally along with rubber tube parallel to it in your palm. Gently roll it for 1 to 2 minutes. Keep it aside. 
Coming to the charging the new bars chamba. Place the cover slip over the central platform of the chamba. Mix the contents of the bulb thoroughly. Discard few drops of fluid from the pipette as stem contains only diluting fluid. Place the tip of the pipette in between the edges of cover slip and chamber. Gently press the tube. Then the drop of fluid will spread under the cover slip by capillary action. Then wait for 1 to 2 minutes to allow the cells to settle down. Coming to the observation. Focus the new bus chamber under low power objective of the microscope to look for the uniform distribution of cells. Acid Hematin Method For this method, we need Sahli's hemometer, n betaine hydrochloric acid, distilled water, pricking apparatus and of course we need a sample of blood. The hemometer which consists of a, a rectangular box, comparator fixed with two solid standard colored glass rods on either sides and it has an opaque white background which provides the necessary contrast for easy comparison. A glass tube which is graduated in percentage from 0 to 140 on one side and in gram percentage from 2 to 22 on the other side. Now the hemoglobin pipette is marked up to 20 cubic mm. If the blood is drawn, it amounts about 0.02 ml of blood. And the other one is a glass rad which is used as a stirrer and a dropper to add the distilled water. Principle. Blood is mixed with N by 10 hydrochloric acid resulting in conversion of the hemoglobin into acid hematin which is brown in color. Then the solution is diluted till its color matches with the brown colored glass rods of the comparator box. The concentration of the hemoglobin is read directly from this experiment. Now let's move on to the procedure. Clean the apparatus and ensure that they are dry. Then fill the diluting tube with N by 10 hydrochloric acid up to the lowest mark that is up to 10% or 2 gram per deciliter. Now clean the figure and allow it to dry. Draw the blood with hemoglobin pipette up to 20 cubic mm mark in the pipette. Then wipe off any blood adhering to the tip and immediately transfer the blood into the diluting tube and rinse well. Avoid foaming. Then mix the contents thoroughly with the glass red. Leave the solution to stand for about 10 minutes for the maximum conversion of hemoglobin of the blood into acid hematin which is the basic principle behind this experiment. In the clinical dental subject specialities, we have various practical videos to help the students understand and even practice the processes at home. For example, this is a video showing the reactions of glucose. It sequences stepwise the procedures of all the tests with clear audio description to help the students understand as well as recall that learning easily. Take 2 ml of glucose solution, add 2 drops of 1% alcoholic alpha naphthol and mix the solution. After that add 2 ml of concentrated H2SO4 along the sides of the test tube. A purple color ring is formed at the junction of two liquids. Benedict's test. This is performed using Benedict's reagent. So in this we have to take 5 ml of Benedict's reagent. To that add 8 drops of glucose solution and boil for 2 minutes. Brick red precipitate is seen. Barfoid's test. To 3 ml of Barfoid's reagent, add 1 ml of glucose solution and boil for about 1 minute. Brick red precipitate is seen at bottom of the test tube. Selvinov's test. To 3 ml of reagent, add 1 ml of sugar solution and boil for 1 minute. Cherry red color is not seen with glucose. Let us learn the requirements of this experiment. The requirements are 
by urate reagent protein standard and distilled water we also require three clean dry test tubes for blank standard and test respectively we also require micro pipettes along with respective disposable tips we will be requiring a timer to note down the time finally to take the absorbance of the test solutions we require a colorimeter this video shows the carving of a permanent maxillary molar a systematic and easy way to perform the required carving skill which supports the students practice of it at their homes and at their convenience 7.5 mm on the wax block then we divide the crown into 3 equal thirds horizontally and into 2 equal halves vertically as shown i recommend you to have an extra 0.5 mm measurement for later adjustments then we mark the surfaces according to the tooth number which we choose to carve now remove the excess wax and round off the edges on the palatal and buccal surfaces then we proceed to form the cervical line cervical line is almost straight on all the sides except on the mesial side where it is convex towards the crown portion This video from the subject dental materials is showing the correct skilled manipulation of alginate impression material. 
The video lesson comes alongside a detailed written script to help the student learn, understand and recall the topic better. The objective of this demonstration is manipulation of alginate impression material. Alginate is a irreversible hydrocolloid impression material. It is available as a powder which can be mixed with water to a required consistency and used as an impression material. The uses of alginate impression material are making primary impressions of dentulous and edentulous patients, for cast duplication, for making impressions to prepare diagnostic or study models, for manipulation of alginate impression by manual method we need a flexible rubber bowl, a curved spatula, a measuring jar and a scoop. Before the start of dispensing alginate, the alginate in the jar is mixed thoroughly by moving the jar around. This helps in getting a homogeneous mix of the material inside. There are procedure videos related to the preclinical subjects too. This lesson shows a class 1 cavity preparation done on a typhodont. Class 1 cavity preparation for composite. It should include all pits and fissures. Follow the cuspal outlines. Start the cavity preparation from the central fissure. Prepare initial cavity depth of 0.2 to 0.5 mm. Now increase the depth. Maintain the thickness of marginal ridges, mesial and distal marginal ridges for 2 mm. Maintain the width of the marginal ridges. Check the cavity intermittently for the outline form and depth of the cavity. Similar to amalgam restoration. For the composite restoration, the cavity should be convergent, not divergent, and the wall should be smooth. Flatten the pulpal floor using hand instruments. Remove any debris remnant using cotton swab. Now the cavity is ready for composite restoration. Armentarium for composite restoration, composite carrier, etchant, bonding agent, composite restorative material. Applicant tip, glass lab for dispensing the composite, place the agent on the tooth surface, on the cavo surface margins, leave for 20 seconds, remove the agent first using cotton swab. wash it with distilled water. Dry the surface using wet cotton pellet. Now take the bonding agent on the applicator tip, place the bonding agent into the cavity and rub the tooth surface. 
with bonding agent remove excess bonding agent then cure for 20 seconds place the curing light as close as possible to the tooth surface cure for 20 seconds take the composite restorative material remove upper one layer of composite discard it take the composite material onto the side of glass slab spatulate the composite material to relieve internal stresses within the composite now take 1 mm increments for placing into the cavity using composite carrier shade matching should be done using different shades of composite material placed on the buccal surface of teeth without etching and bonding agent cure the composite wear the protective eyewear each one one increment should be cured for 20 seconds check the shade matching shade is not matched with this composite use another shade of material This video lesson shows the process of taking a preliminary impression in a thorough yet easy way for the young dental learner. The objective of the demonstration is to make a preliminary impression of an edentulous maxilla. For this, a type 1 impression compound and an edentulous metallic dye are used. For convenience, the exercise is broken down into six steps. The first step is selection of a tray, a edentulous metallic non perforated stock tray is taken. The second step, modification of the tray. The third step, manipulation of the impression compound. The fourth step is loading the tray with the impression material. Fifth step is making of an impression. And the sixth step is trimming of excessive impression material. Selection of the tray. Select metallic edentulous non perforated stock tray which extends over the metal die covers all the anatomic landmarks of the metal die anteriorly extending into the labial sulcus laterally into the buccal sulcus and posteriorly extending over the hamular notch and the posterior palatal seal area if the selected tray is underextended in a certain area or impinges over the anatomic structures the tray can be modified. Tray modification can be done with the use of a metal plier to prevent impingement on the anatomic structures. Tray modification can also be done by extending with self-cure acrylic material to extend over all the anatomic areas. Thus, the selected modified tray is now used to load the impression material. Type 1 impression compound is a thermoplastic impression material. It is softened using a water bath with water at a temperature of 55 to 60 degrees centigrade. The impression compound is broken into pieces. The impression compound has a low thermal conductivity. So, kneading of the impression compound is a prerequisite to ensure uniform softening of the impression compound. Kneading of the impression compound can be done under water which is known as wet kneading. Wet kneading ensures that the plasticity of the impression compound is maintained. The water incorporated into the impression compound acts as a plasticizer in wet kneading procedure. The objective of this demonstration is review of the anatomic landmarks of the edentulous maxilla. This model is a positive replica of the edentulous maxilla. The colored portions of the model show the anatomic areas. The anatomic 
landmarks can be classified for study purpose into the limiting structures which border the anatomic area, the supporting structures and the relief structures. The limiting structures, the labial frenum, the labial vestibule of the sulcus, the buccal freni, the buccal sulcus or the vestibule, the hamular notch and the posterior palatal seal area comprise of the limiting structures. The labial frenum. Labial frenum is a V-shaped fold of mucous membrane that is seen in the midline of the maxilla. This fold of mucous membrane divides the labial vestibule into the right and left halves. No muscle attachment is seen in this frenum. The buccal frenum. Buccal freni can be single or double broad fan shaped folds seen in the lateral aspect of the maxilla. Buccal freni can have muscle fiber attachments of the levator anguli oris, orbicularis oris and the buccinator muscles. The labial vestibule or the labial sulcus extends from the buccal frenum on one side to the buccal frenum on the other side. It is bound anteriorly and laterally by the upper lip in the medial aspect by the slopes of the residual alveolar ridge and posteriorly by the buccal frenum. The orbicularis oris muscles is the major muscle that has its presence in its area. The buccal vestibule. Buccal vestibule or the buccal sulcus is a depressed area on either side of the maxilla extending from the buccal frenum anteriorly to the hamular notch posteriorly. It is bound laterally by the cheek and medially by the lateral slopes of the residual alveolar ridge. The buccinator muscle, the mandibular position, ramus and the coronoid process of the mandible, alveolar ridge size affect the size of the buccal sulcus. The learning resource material for clinical teaching consists of videos which capture the case dynamics together with the detailed history taking, general physical and systemic examination, investigation reports, differential diagnosis and how to come to a provisional and a final diagnosis and management. This facilitates deliberation regarding the approach to diagnosis and management of each particular case scenario. Ascites is a condition where there is a collection of fluid in the peritoneal cavity. Small amounts of fluid that is a minimal ascites would be asymptomatic for the patient. But a large amount which would be more than a litre will be symptomatic for the patient. The silent clinical features of this condition include a uniform distension of the abdomen with fullness of the flanks, tense shiny skin, presence of abdominal striae due to the chronic stretching of the skin, puncture marks in chronic ascites patients due to previous tapping of fluid, umbilicus which may be flushed with the surface of the abdomen or everted or even ballooned out, divarication of the recti muscles. The abdomen may be soft in the earlier stages when the fluid is minimal. But when ascites is larger, the abdomen becomes tense. A shifting dullness and a fluid thrill are pathognomonic of this ascitic condition. Hello students. Today let us discuss a case of ascites. A 55-year-old male named Govin, living in Vizag, who is working as a carpenter, came into the hospital with a chief complaint of increase in the abdominal girth and swelling in both the lower legs. The history of present illness includes the patient was apparently healthy until one month ago when he noticed a swelling of his abdomen and both legs. He visited a nearby doctor and was given furosemide. His symptoms initially improved but recurred when medication ran out of two days prior to the admission. He mentioned that he rapidly gained weight and was approximately 70 kg. The patient denies any history of fever night sweats, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, jaundice or prior disease of liver, kidneys, heart or GI tract. 
His past history includes, there's no history of similar complaint in the past, the patient was not a diabetic, there's no history of any hypertension, epilepsy, bronchial asthma, tuberculosis or jaundice. There's no history of suggestive of rheumatic fever. Personal history, patient takes mixed diet, bowel and bladder habits are normal, patient is not a smoker and patient is a chronic alcoholic consumer. There was no history of loss of weight. Treatment history, the patient was not on any medication. Coming to the family history, both of his parents are in good health and there is no such illness in his family. Intravenous cannulation is a process by which a small cannula is inserted into a peripheral vein. The indications for an IV cannulation are a requirement for repeated blood sampling, IV administration of fluids, IV admin of medication including chemotherapeutic agents, IV administration of blood or blood product and IV administration of radiological contrast agents. Contraindications to this procedure are Though there are no absolute contraindications, any surface skin lesion or pathology, one would not choose that site for the IV cannulation. All the equipment must be kept ready. These are gloves, the IV cannula, an alcohol swab and dressing to put over the cannula later. How do we do the procedure of IV cannulation? First, we must confirm the patient details. We must explain the procedure we are about to do to the patient. Take the patient's consent. We must clean the hands, wear the gloves, position the patient's arm properly, inspect the arm for a suitable vein, apply a tourniquet proximal to the site of the insertion. In this procedure which we are seeing, the skin site is cleaned for 30 seconds and allowed to dry. We palpate on the surface for the vein, prepare the cannula, Secure the vein from below, insert the cannula at an angle of 10 to 30 degrees to the skin, observe the flashback, withdraw the introducer or the needle, advance the cannula into the vein, remove the introducer needle. We also have various clinical videos for the final year students. For example, the inferior alveolar nerve block being given on a patient in this video lesson for the inferior alveolar nerve block, we ask the patient to open his mouth wide. Then we palpate the landmarks. The landmarks for the inferior alveolar nerve block are the anterior border of the rhinus of the mandible, the deepest point of the coronoid notch, the occlusal plane, the contralateral premolars. From the contralateral premolars, we insert the needle at a point which is just lateral to the pericomandibular FA. The needle is inserted about 20 to 25 millimeters until we hit the bone, that is the lingula. We aspirate and deposit about 1.5 to 2 ml of the solution very slowly. Then very slowly we draw the needle. Ask the patient to close his mouth, open him and close his mouth once or twice. For the inferior alveolar nerve block, the landmarks are the anterior border of the ramus, the deepest point of the coronoid notch, the opposing premolars. We move from the contralateral side and about 20 to 25 millimeters of the needle is inserted. We proceed inside until we hit the bone. The moment we hit the bone, we are quite near to the lingula. The height of the injection is about 5 to 6 mm above the occlusal plane. We aspirate and we deposit about 1.5 to 1.8 mm of the solution very very slowly after aspiration. For the lingual nerve block, we withdraw the needle, move medially and then deposit about 0.5 mm of the solution to block the lingual nerve. The instrument shown here is a dental elevator which is called as Kuplan's elevator. It has a large pear shaped handle, it has straight shank and blade of it has both concave end and a convex surface and an inclined plane. It has concave groove on one side which is typical of this Kuplan's elevator and Kuplan's elevator works on the principle of wedge 
principle as well as first order lever principle. The instruments shown here are Cryer's elevator which are paired instruments. It is the second most commonly used elevators in tooth extractions. It is used especially for the removal of broken roots in the tooth sockets and when there is an adjacent empty socket, it can be used to elevate the tooth adjacent to the empty socket. And this works on the principle of wheel and axle rotation. The instrument shown here are Winter's crossbar elevators. It is similar to Cryer's elevator. It has a feature of handle being perpendicular to the shank of the instrument. It has the maximum mechanical advantage due to the crossbar handles and the offset blade that it has. It is mainly used for the removal of mandibular roots when the adjacent root has already been extracted. It has a triangular blade with a sharp tip and it is especially used for the removal of mandibular molar roots when one root is already been extracted for the removal of the other root. This triangular tip is placed in the empty socket and the root is lifted off with that sharp tip by using a wheel and axle principle. This Winter's crossbar elevator works on the principle of wheel and axle principle. These are Apexo elevators having a biangulated sharp working tip. Working surface is grooved and it is used to elevate the root pieces by wedging between the root and the bone surface. The instrument shown here is a luxator. Luxators are the instruments having a sharp working tip which is used to insert into the periodontal ligament space in a wedging action and giving micro rotations. The luxator is able to destroy the periodontal ligament fibers and move the root or the tooth so that it makes the tooth extraction easy. Luxators are especially used in implant dentistry and also for any atraumatic removal of the tooth, these luxators will be of immense help. The instrument shown here is an extraction forceps. The parts of extraction forceps are handles, hinge and beaks. Hinge is the connecting mechanism between the handles and the beaks. Another important topic is emergency drugs. The video lesson comes with a continuous running subtitle script below the visual to help the students easily understand and to learn better. Dinitrate 10 mg is useful for angina. Normally GTL spray or tablets have to be used. These are not freely available in the market. So this tablet can be taken sublingually to relieve the pain of angina. Asthalin inhaler. This is used for acute management of an asthmatic attack. So in case of an acute asthmatic attack, take the lid out and ask the patient to uh, open the mouth and then this has to be shaken and then two actuations have to be given inside the mouth. The inhaler can also be given through a spacer device and after 5 minutes if there is no response it can be repeated. Adrenaline injection 1 is to 1000 ampules. Preloaded syringes are readily available but they are costly. In case of an emergency a preloaded syringe will give you that extra time and avoids unnecessary delay. In case of non-availability of preloaded syringes these ampules are of a huge help. This ampule, uh, one ml has to be loaded into the syringe and has to be delivered into the lateral thigh muscle. Soluble aspirin 325 mg tablets used in the acute management of myocardial infarction. The tablets have to be chewed and not swallowed. Oral glucose solution, you can use Glucon D or you can use Diet Coke or any solution which has high glucose content, any juice, orange juice or the best thing is to use honey also. In case of a conscious patient, an oral glucose solution is given and in case of an unconscious patient, glucagon 1 mg intramuscularly has to be given. This video lesson shows the important basic process of taking an intraoral radiograph for diagnostics. A type of learning not usually made available to dental students in the conventional classroom teaching.
demonstration of intraoral radiographic technique. The armamentarium used is a mouth mirror, gloves, local anesthesia if required, and a film. I'll be demonstrating how to take an intraoral radiograph in a clinical setup. Let us begin by understanding the various parts of an X-ray machine. This is a fixed stand. The fixed stand has a control panel. The control panel is used to adjust the exposure time of a radiograph. This is the movable arm. The movable arm connects the X-ray housing to the fixed stand. 